we identify and, and go out to the strategic and say, hey, this company has $10 million of sales and is making a million dollars right now, but if you own this thing, you have you know excess capacity, you have these different things, that ultimately you can make this go from a million dollars of profit to three, four million dollars of profit with the snap of a finger. Tonight's show, we sought out a top professional in the area of M&A, mergers and acquisitions. Sheldon Brickman, an old friend, he's not old, but an old friend. President of Rockshore Advisors, Sheldon has over a quarter century of M&A advisory and business development experience. His, the work that he has performed has resulted in transactions of over $40 billion. That's with a B, yes, $40 billion. Rockshore Advisors covers a range of advisory services, including traditional M&A, mergers and acquisitions, uh, sell side, buy side, due diligence. The list goes on. Tonight's show is going to be all about M&A. Sheldon Brickman, thank you for joining me here on Mind Your Business. Yes, look, it's great being here. Thank you so much for having me. I've wanted to be on here for a long time, thank spend you. some time with you, and, uh, and uh, talk about uh, mergers and acquisitions. So first, talk about uh, you started, now again, you've been in the industry for a good few decades. Um, Rockshore Advisors is around 10 years old. Talk about the, the, the forming of your group. Yeah, so I started my career... Um, in, in public accounting, I am a CPA, um, and then went on to, to work for a Japanese investment company. And after that, I joined AIG, the large insurance company. Was there 17 years, various responsibilities in mergers and acquisitions, did deals around the world, a significant amount in Asia, in Europe, in the Middle East. Um, and after 17 years at AIG, I went over to Aetna, the big health insurance company that was uh, recently uh, merged with CVS, and I was head of their international mergers and acquisitions. Anything outside the United States was, was my, my team's domain. And I was fortunate to have the opportunity, uh, as you said, almost 10 years ago, to, to leave corporate America and go out, go out on my own. And, you, you know, it could be a scary thing. You know, you're, 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 you know, you're used to being part of corporate America. You're used to getting a paycheck every two weeks and, uh, you know, bonuses, etc. And then you sort of leave that and go on to, you know, be on your own. But, you know, I would encourage people to sort of take the years of experience and the talents that they've developed over those years and not be afraid to, you know, to go with it and start their own thing. So I've been very fortunate. It's been nine, you know, nine plus years. We've done a you know significant amount of transactions. Thank God, a, a, a lot of you know happy clients, and um, and it's been a lot of fun. I find mergers and acquisitions to be you know a really um, interesting area of working. I mean, one one thing that we're picking up initially at this point in the interview is that you love M and A. <laughs> How important is it for someone? Now, some people like driving a a, a school bus. Some people. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever area it is, how important is it? Just a quick question to kind of love, be passionate about what you do. Well, really, you know, like you said, you really, you, you know, to go to work every day, you, you really have to like what you do. I, I think mergers and acquisitions is just, you know, very interesting. You know, from from you know early in life, I always enjoyed finance, and I knew when I you know started, you know, when I started in college, and when even when I came out of college. I knew I wanted to be something in finance. What that was, didn't really know. But I figured, you know, God would put me on the path. And, um, you know, being in public accounting and being exposed to those things, going to work for a Japanese investment company and being exposed to sort of the investment world, what was really good foundation for then joining AIG and, and, and doing mergers and acquisitions. You know, it, the interesting thing about m and in my role is that you... You, you work with the client, you get to know their business, you find a buyer for them, you get a deal done, and then it's off to the next transaction. And it's just different industries, different transactions, different people. I just find it, you know, just Love be it. very, very, very self-fulfilling. Sheldon, for those out there that are not familiar with M&A, the mergers and acquisitions, what is that all about? What's the simple definition before we start getting deep into the details? Well, in its the most simplest way, Someone owns a company, and let's say, let's take Coca-Cola. 
if Coca-Cola's owners decided one day, hey, we, we want to sell, um, you know, then they would engage investment bankers uh, like myself, they'd probably hire a Goldman Sachs or, you know, hey, a bigger one for them. Down. Wait, okay, they, okay. They, can is, okay, they can hire me. They can hire us. Yeah, sure. We can get it done. Some of those, yeah, hey, some of those executives might be tuned into the show tonight. Okay. Right. Um, and um, they'd hire investment bankers to sort of get them ready for a sale. What does that mean? They would um, put together a dynamic financial model that shows their historical financial performance, current financial performance, and projected financial performance. And as well, put together what's called a SIM, a confidential information memorandum, which is you know a PowerPoint presentation that gives the history of the company, shows both qualitative and quantitative what the company is, talks about the owners, talks about their product, and then we take the financial information, we take the 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 qualitative information, and we have um, you know we have proprietary databases at our disposal that for that specific industry we can target potential buyers that would have an interest in acquiring this business and we you know approach them on a no names basis first tell them about the company they get you know hey this is something that I'm interested they would sign a non disclosure we'd share the information have you know management you know meetings with them and then ultimately what would come out of that process is potential buyers would shower our buyers with letters of intent LOIs and um, our bar, you know, the, the, my client, they'd have to choose among a couple of letters of intent and say, hey, we're going to go with them. They sign an exclusive uh, letter of intent. Do, uh, do, do, the potential buyer does due diligence. At the same time, they are, they are negotiating a purchase agreement. And hopefully 60 days out, a transaction is consummated and everybody's happy. You make, M&A. It, you make it sound simple. It is, it is. When you hire professionals like us, we make it so simple for you. But, uh, yep. My guest this evening is Sheldon Brickman. He is the the founder and CEO of Rockshore Advisors. Sheldon, over the years, has been involved and facilitated over $40 billion in the area of M&A. That's quite impressive. So now we turn, in the first uh, segment of tonight's show, we were talking about kind of the basics of M&A. Now let's start digging in. But, you know, stories are always great. And to give perspective on mergers and acquisitions, perhaps, Sheldon, you could talk about the biggest deal you've ever been involved. And sure. I'm not asking you to share anything confidential, obviously, but uh, share some exciting tidbits that, of course, can help people to frame the subject of M&A. Sure. So, um, obviously, when I was, you know, working for um, AIG, uh, those transactions were, you know, astronomical. Um, We made an acquisition, uh, you know, north of $18 billion um, in the insurance and wealth management space. Um, But... Since you know more of my focus for Rockshore since since I've been on you know since I've been on my own, our, our team, the largest deal we did was north of two hundred million dollars. Um, it was actually something in, in in the healthcare space that's you know quite hot now, and uh, but we've do, we've done deals as small as you know as small as two or three million dollars. A lot of deals in the forty million dollar space. But uh, you know, but the largest deal was was north of two hundred million dollars. You know, a great transaction for the seller, and um, and the buyer was very happy as well. Now, obviously, without getting into any details, can you walk us through? In the first segment, you did explain the mechanics, but here, from the vantage point of an actual deal, kind of walk us through it, and even potentially some of the surprises that could and sometimes happen. Uh, during during a merger and ac- an, an, an acquisition deal. Sure. So um, when we get w- when we're engaged by a um, a seller to you know represent them, the first thing that we're going to do is um, work with them in a very confidential way. And, and I, I want to preface that confidentiality obviously is very very important to sellers because a they don't want their customers to know what's going on. B, they don't want their competition to know what's going on because if the competition right. finds out, you know, they go to the customers and say, hey, you don't want to be a customer of this guy. But well, I can honestly say that, that um, confidentiality is one of the 
most important things that clients ask me at the time when things are kicking off. And I can honestly say that we've never had an issue. We've never had an issue where a client has called up and said, you don't know what happened. My, com- you know, my competitor just found out. We have a, v- a very tight process where um, only our team that's working on things knows what's going on. Once potential buyers get involved, they sign a very tight non-disclosure agreement. And, you know, people, you know, could say, oh, well, you know, do people really honor them? Well, yeah, people really do. And, and history has shown that uh, if someone signs a non-disclosure, they know they're, they know they're liable if, right. if, if, if they leak, leak it out. So, um, so we get involved. We start working with them. First thing from a financial, you know, inf- information standpoint, we either get with their CFO or their outside accountant to to get a significant amount of financial related information historicals revenues expenses we, we we focus on you know getting a really good understanding of the company and the business understanding things from a financial statement standpoint what is driving revenue growth what is driving profit margins you know is the how do they compare to their competitors are they growing faster than their competitors are they more profitable than com- their competitors so the first step is we're getting a handle over the financial information to be able to tell the story quanti- uh, quantitatively to be able to really tell a good story to show the company's strengths from a, from, from a financial standpoint growth and revenue growth and, and, and strong and strong margins and growth and margins then, then we're working with the company to be able to tell the story. Every company has a story. The company, the founder started the business at a young age, and you know, brought in, you know, and grew and grew. Every company has its unique story and and how it got to where where it is. Every company has a story in terms of its unique product or unique services. So we then you know, we're crafting the confidential information memorandum to be able to really tell the owner's story the right way. Um, and also to be able to show from a financial standpoint that the, that, that the financial performance of the, of the company is something that is desirable. So we work with them, ultimately preparing the information. They review it. They give us comments. After, at, at, at when, when things are done, we're ready to go out you know, to market. So that's, you know, that, that's, that, that's the process till we go out to market. And then going out to market, you know, we've spent you know, parallel to the materials that we're preparing, we're also preparing, you know, a list of potential buyers. Who, who would be a good fit from, for, for, you know, strategically for this buyer? There are also, there are two types of buyers. They're financial buyers and they're strategic buyers. Financial buyers are private equity firms that, that, that want, to, want to make an acquisition. They have a lot of money to put to work and they want to buy companies. They could be, you know, good buyers. What we have found is, you know, strategic buyers you know, can pay even more because they can unlock synergies. Um, you know, by whether it be in, in, in whether it be in introducing the the seller's products to the, through their uh, sales uh, sales representatives. Mm-hmm. There are so many things, uh, so many ways that a, a, a true strategic acquirer can unlock value. So we 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 very much we focus both on financial and strategic buyers, but we very much you know per, you know prefer to find the right strategic. Now that's a very interesting point that the strategic buyer will will, will many times leverage the the acquisition into their own like like to add to their portfolio of products so to speak as opposed to just a private equity firm which is looking just to I don't want to say cash out but like okay how much could be maybe it's a strong statement, how much could be milked from that company? As opposed to a strategic buyer, which is saying, okay, I, I now could provide so much more value in the marketplace because of this new acquisition. Yeah, that's very true. It's very true. I mean, think about it, it, it you, you know, take uh, an example. I mean, let's just take an example of, you know, Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. If Coca-Cola was going to acquire a company that, you know, strategic company, let's say they were acquiring, you, you know, well, a, as they do a, that a, many times, a, a, another a, another beverage brand, mm-hmm. or something that just adds to the, their trucks right, exactly. are on the road anyway. Exactly. So when you know when Snapple was bought, you know by you know by a company, they were just you know, taking their their product and putting it through their distribution channel, and you know it just equals to you know more more growth in sales for them. Got you. Got you. Now let's swing back to the other direction. What is kind of the the smallest deal 
that it makes sense for someone who, who built a company to entertain, to, to sell, or to be acquired by another company? Um, what I say is probably something that's at least $5 million in revenues um, is something that w w would get a, you know, a buyer interested. You know, a buyer wants to make an acquisition of something that's going to be meaningful. It's going to make a, it's going to make a meaningful um, impact to their business. And, you know, obviously there are definite industries that even acquisitions with, with companies with $1 million in revenues, you know, take, you know, as an example, we've done a lot of transactions with insurance brokers. Mm -hmm. Insurance brokers is an extremely hot market. It's been hot for a while and it continues to be very, very hot. If there was an insurance broker, even with a million, a million and a half of revenue, there would be, in an instant, you, you, we would have 10 potential buyers you know, within a week of going out to market. Um, but generally speaking, things need to be really you know, bigger. You know, I'd say, like, like I said, $5 million of, you know, of revenue. You know, again, the bigger, the better in terms of getting, you know, interest in a, in a buyer. But, uh, yeah, probably, you know, that size. We're speaking with Sheldon Brickman of Rockshore Advisors. Um, and tonight's subject is all about M&A, mergers and acquisitions. An interesting um, angle, and this applies technically to our firm here at Bottom Line Marketing Group, um, around maybe it was a year or two ago, Hebrew National was selling and uh, looking to... Uh, sell out to a, a big company. And the Wall Street Journal wrote an article about it, and they indicated that their value was, I don't want to say substantially higher than what they really were, were, were their value was, but it part of the value was their, their tagline, right? We answer to a higher authority, the famous tagline of Hebrew National. And they, they had... The article itself identified that tagline as adding to their value. So I guess my question is, how important is it for a company that's looking to go to market to have a, a presence out there, to have a great brand? Yeah, obviously, so we spoke about you know, strategic you know, value. So, so let's spend a couple of minutes on talking you know, specifically for Hebrew National and you know, their uh, their uh, tagline of "We answer to a higher authority." Y Hebrew National, um, you know, let, let's say as an example, let's say the last year before they sold, they had you know ten million dollars, you know, uh, of business. But it's very possible that their sales distribution was sleepy, and and they just hadn't spent. Um, they had the right tagline, which they had gotten years before, but they really weren't spending the marketing dollars. You know, to you know, get it in front of you know, in front of people. But if there was if there was the right strategic that has a marketing engine, and then is able to bring in Hebrew National into the fold and bring it as one of the, one of their portfolio companies, and they, you know, just with their you know current marketing efforts, be able to leverage that, it, it could be significantly worth significantly more money. Now, earlier in the show, you had mentioned, and we talked about strategic, a company that is looking to acquire another company should naturally look for ways that the new acquisition could help them in, 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 in a greater capacity out in the marketplace. Is that something that, let's say, Rockshore Advisors works on, that when, when you pair companies in order to make sure that there isn't just duplicity? Like, I'll give an example. If, let's say, a major uh, pharmacy chain acquires another pharmacy chain, I imagine that they're looking at the real estate and seeing, are there drugstores down the block from the present stores or are they five miles out, right? Because if they're down the block, then it's just duplicity. You can't, you know, what's the point of having, of, of acquiring another uh, you know, entity and that it's, it's, it's not really this, you're not, you're not increasing capacity, you're not grading, getting really more, reach in the marketplace, you're just creating, you know, a footprint, but it's very close to the other, that I imagine would be somewhat of a waste. Is that part of what a company like yours does in the research? Again, the, the, it's not due diligence yet, because we're not talking about the buyer, we're talking about from the seller's perspective. 
identifying the prospective buyers. So that, that's... Yeah, so what you're touching upon is sort of what we call expense synergies. Okay. Um, two certain, uh, two, uh, you know, two strategic buyers, more so than financial buyers. So strategic buyers, like you said, that have other locations, etc. What we do is we try and identify potential expense savings uh, you know, that a strategic would look at and say, hey, we don't need those expenses expenses anymore, whether it be locations, whether it be warehouses. Um, and, and these expenses, we, we, we identify and, and go out to the strategic and say, hey, this company has $10 million of sales and is making a million dollars right now. But if you own this thing, you have, you know, excess capacity, you have these different things that ultimately you can make this go from a million dollars of profit to three, four million dollars of profit with the snap of a finger. So we, we do that on their behalf. Very often also, we will be engaged by companies, you know, to help them because they know that we've looked at the company from an M&A standpoint. They'll want, us, they'll want to engage us and say, hey, can you help us you know, specifically identify, you know, additional synergies, you know, that, that happens as well, where the actual buyer, we were representing the sellers, but the buyers will engage us because they like the work that we've done, they like that we've seen, and they know that we have insight that, you know, we can provide them. My guest is Sheldon Brickman. We are talking about mergers and acquisitions. Sheldon, what is the website of your firm where people can find out more information? RockshoreAdvisors.com. You'll be able to see everything you want about us. Mind your business with these examples right here on 710 WOR and the IHAR Radio Network. Thank you for joining me for an, an incredible uh, presentation all about mergers and acquisitions. And for that, we have none other than Sheldon Brickman of Rockshore Advisors, who has a combined experience in being involved with over $40 billion in M&A work. That's pretty impressive. Um... In fact, I, uh, before before I get to a, a, a key question here, uh, perhaps you could just share what is M and A like? Because you've you've done this around the world, and you said you've done it in the Far East, in the Middle East. Um, perhaps you could even talk about some differences in is the word mentality or approach. What interests uh, a Japanese firm to acquire a? an American firm or vice versa, or it could, perhaps you could share, shed some light on that. Sure. So you know, we'll take it first from, you, you know, dealing with acqui in acquisitions sort of outside the United States. There's, you know, this spe specific challenge because the beauty of, the, the beauty of, of, the, of our financial you know, companies in, in, in the U.S. is that they're governed by accounting rules. Um, and you, the, the country, besides everyone, you know, employing CPAs and being very aware of it, um, when a company is audited, a, a buyer know, you know, gives them a certain comfort that the numbers are what the, the company is saying they are. When you go outside the United States and you start dealing with companies in China, Japan, um, you know, Japan may be a little less so because you know they, they have pretty strict accounting rules. But some some of the you know Eastern European countries, um, you know, but again, since China is very much you know in, in the spotlight, you know, you know, focusing on them, you, you know, when a company that's for sale presents you with their financial statements, you know, you really have to do your due diligence to understand and and, and get a good feel. Are they really showing us, you know, re reality? And um, it's not necessarily because someone's, you know, being dishonest. It, it's just that they don't necessarily know how to account for certain things, and things aren't done right. So, you know, the, the, the it's really desirable to do uh, deals in the U.S. because, you know, w w you know, if they have a reputable accounting firm, what you see is usually what you get. But when you go outside outside the United States, that that could be, you know, that could be a challenge. Now, Sheldon, this is a question that's completely off topic, but just since you've traveled so much uh, overseas, what are some of the uh, rugged traveler tips that you could share? Oh, boy. Well, um, you know, being Jewish, you got to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that, that you know where all the kosher restaurants are, okay. uh, which can be challenging but rewarding. I, I've been to, I've eaten in some very nice restaurants in, in Bangkok, Thailand, 
in, um, in Shanghai, China, in Hong Kong, obviously, there you know, have been there many, many times and, you know, some great restaurants. Paris is an absolutely great place to be doing mergers and acquisitions, have some of the uh, best, uh, best restaurants in the world, especially on the kosher side. So, um, uh, you know, pack well, make sure, whenever you're traveling internationally, make sure you have travel insurance because you never know what can happen overseas and you want to be able to have good medical coverage. Important tip. Also, would you advise that someone should arrive 24 hours before a meeting or at least the night before, or is it okay to take a red eye and just come straight from the airport to a meeting? No, it's always better to get there early, but, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, to some of these meetings, you know, someone calls up and says, I want to see you Monday morning. You don't necessarily have the luxury of, you know, of of arriving as early early as you can, but uh, I I remember I, um, I, I had to fly out to Sydney, Australia, and um, as you can imagine, tremendously long flight. I think I had to fly to Los Angeles, you know, a good five, uh, five, six hours, and then on to Sydney, which was, you know, probably another 14-ish hours, and arrived very early in the morning and had to be fresh for, for a nine, 10 o'clock uh, meetings. About two, three years ago, Dubai arrived five o'clock in the morning and had to be, you know, fresh for an eight o'clock uh, meeting. So, uh, but whenever we can, we try and get there early, like you say. Sheldon, we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. Here is a key question. How does a seller know when it's the right time to sell? Mm, And I guess part of that question is, does it have to do with a benchmark in in reaching a certain threshold in terms of annual sales? Is it the amount of years a company has been out there? It's a very broad question, but that's what we turn to. Well, it's a broad question, but it's really, really a great question. You know, what, what I have found um, is owners are very emotional. There's a tremendous emotional attachment to a business. So it's not just about getting, you know, top dollar in, in selling their business, but they want to make sure that, first of all, their baby, the company that they've built over, over all these years, is in the right hands. Um, but second and just as important is very often they have employees that have been working for them for you know 20 30 years and they want to make sure that 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 uh, it's the right home for them and th- the new buyer is going to be a place where they're going to be comfortable so part of it you know there's a lot of emotion that th- th- there's a lot of emotion that goes into you know deciding okay it's time um so what what i would say is that um Mentally, the very, very first thing is mentally an owner of a business needs to uh, make a decision that it's time because you, you, you can't be half pregnant and going into a sale. You can't say, okay, let me see what I get. Let me see if you know, someone will put enough money on the table. It, 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 it's, a, it's a process. It's, it's, it's a time-consuming process. It's, it's really all-consuming. All, all we make it as easy as we can. We take as much of the burden off. But nonetheless, it's very much um, uh, an intense process for them. And you can't go in half-baked. So they really need to mentally decide, yes, I am ready to sell. Now, you, you know, approaching retirement is you know, a, a popular reason for, you know, for, for selling. Um, in this day and age, there are a lot of buyers out there, and they're constantly calling companies and saying, "Hey, we want to buy you," and and that gets the the thinking, you know, in their mind. Hey, maybe I should, you know, consider selling. And it's so it's ultimately going to be a combination of being mentally prepared that 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 I, I want to do a transaction, but but it's also that the company's ready. Obviously, if a company uh, doesn't have you, you know, is on a downtrend or even a slow trend in terms of their revenue growth, and they're not very profitable, it's not going to be a good time to sell because it's, it's, it's not going to command the kind of valuation that, that someone would want. company needs to be really in a good place, be able to show that the past two or three years ha- has achieved good, you know, top-line revenue growth and with healthy margins because that's going to be des- that's going to be de- desirable. No one wants to buy a company that's shrinking. No one wants to buy a company that's sleepy and you know you, you know very slow growth. So if someone has a company that has healthy growth, healthy margins, 
they're at a point in their career that that they're will that they want to sort of consider retiring that they should definitely consider transaction and the other important thing that i would i would say is someone can't decide today i want to sell my business i want to retire so let's get this done in six months i'm out of here really for the most part most transactions have what's called an earnout. an earnout is a period of time after the deal is sold that a certain percentage of the sales purchase price is held back to you know to for a year or two or three sometimes for for companies for the buyer to see hey this you know this isn't going to fall off the cliff tomorrow and they give incentives to the sellers to hey if you grow higher we'll pay you more over the coming years so what, what I, my point is is that you don't just decide, okay, I'm selling, you get all the money and you, you, you walk away. Usually there's a period of time. So if someone is thinking of, hey, I want to retire in two or three years or four years, they should, really should consider already you know, looking to sell because they're going to have to stick around for a period of time. Now, I know I touched on this earlier, but I still want to hold on to this in terms of the value that a seller can command, is it important that they have a, uh, a solid website, that they have some type of presence? Will that, ultimately, will that increase the value of their company during a transaction? Yeah, very, very often, you know, companies are, 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 are not necessarily just buying um, the pro- a company for its product, but they're they're buying the company for its reputation in the market. You know, very, very often a company does not necessarily have such, um, you know, historical financial performance that, that says, okay, we, we need to make acquisition. But if they have a good social media presence, they have, you know, a, a website that is attracting buyers and, um, uh, and customers, that is, you know, a good reason for, you know, potential buyer to say, hey, we don't have this presence, they have the presence, we have product, we have, you know, we bring certain strategic things to the table. If we marry the two, um, you know, that could be really a home run. Right, like you mentioned earlier, the synergy. Mm-hmm. If they study that the, that the overlap, great. The acquisition will bring to the table X and Y, and we're great at A and B. So then, boom, that's, that's an amazing... Yeah, people like to roll their eyes when people say, hey, if we do 1 plus 1 equals 5, that's what we're trying to get. You know, <laughs> People roll their eyes. But it's really true. The right mergers and acquisition transactions that happen is that there's ultimately you know, 1 plus 1 is going to be more than 2. You combine the two, there's going to be an outcome that's going to be significantly better. That's going to be with revenue synergies, and it could be you know, very possibly with expense-saving synergies. Expense-saving or maybe talent acquisition. Let's say the company, uh, you know, a company A is great, but they're missing a certain part of technology that B will have. Or, 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 or they're missing the sales talent depth that B has. Yeah, you, 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 touched upon, you touched upon something that's really uh, very important. Um, there's, um, it, there are certain industries that are just known that the talent there is on the older side, let, let's just say. And I had, uh, I had two companies that I you know, sold recently that just the fact that the seller was someone in their early 40s was so desirable to potential buyers because they were used to buying companies with you know owners in their mid 60s who were going to retire and not a lot of excitement, but these two companies garnered garnered significant interest in them just for the fact that they had these young dynamic buyers that we we had uh, you know a bidding war on it and the, the potential buyers were falling over each other. The money that they were going to make, that was, that was a separate thing. They wanted the, the talent. And it wasn't just that, them. It was the people working for them. They had young, dynamic talent, talent as well that they wanted to get after. So very, very much a, a, a strong point in M&A. Fascinating. My guest is Sheldon Brickman. Um, Sheldon, how could people find out more about your firm? Well, um, they can look at my website, rockshoreadvisors.com. They can always call me. 917-743-4444, 917-743-4444. 
My assistant won't answer. I will answer the phone myself. And feel free to send a text or a WhatsApp. Yes, that's the way Sheldon is. You, he, he is accessible. I know that for many, many, many years. We've been friends for many, many years. And he is the way, the way you're hearing him tonight and those that are going to be seeing this on YouTube. By the way, of course, this is going to become one of our popular YouTube episodes. Uh, on YouTube, our channel is 710WOR, Mind Your Business. 710WOR, Mind Your Business. And when you subscribe to our channel... You are automatically notified every single time an episode goes live on YouTube. Thank you to all the great listeners here of the show. That's why we're in the top 10 of New York AM radio. And a big reason that we are in the top 10 is because we offer great business advice week in and week out. This week's no different. Sheldon Brickman, an old friend, not old, but uh, youthful spirit, but a lot of experience, decades in the world of mergers and acquisitions. And just to, to give some perspective, he has been instrumental in, in orchestrating deals, a totaling between all the different deals he's been involved with, over $40 billion in merger and acquisition uh, in, in that space. And therefore, we turn to Sheldon for a, his advice, counsel, and perspective. Now, of course, for everyone out there, an important note, as always, seek your own professional. And, of course, if you're looking to do this, you could reach out to Rockshore Advisors. Of course, you could reach out to Sheldon. But any advice that you hear here is purely, you know, it is, is advice, is suggestions, is guidance. But at the same time, of course, everyone should contact their local professional or Sheldon directly. Um, Sheldon, the remaining portion of tonight's show... Something you touched on earlier, but maybe we could really break it out. From the moment that an owner decides, okay, I'm going to sell. I want to be acquired. I, okay. What is the time frame that, should, that they should be thinking about? Is it, like, like you said, they cannot say, okay, hi, I just want to sell, and I'm looking to, <laughs> in 15 days, I want to move to uh, Alcapulco. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I would say is... Um, on, on average, and obviously every situation is, is unique, um, but on average, you, in, a, a process should take between four and six months. And let me, you know, get into sort of a generic, you know, timing, you know, to give, you know, give your listeners a, you know, a, a sense of things. So once we get engaged with the client, you know, we'll, we'll send them, you know, an information request, quantitative, qualitative information to, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the show, to put together not just a dynamic financial model, but also a confidential information memorandum, come up with the potential buyers. That process, and very much it's tied to the, the, the client because, you know, it's, it, our process is as good as the, can only go as good as the information. If, if a company's, you know, accounting is in, is in shambles and the record keeping is in shambles, it's gonna make it a bit more difficult, not impossible. Um, there are workarounds that we can do, but it will obviously take more time. But, you know, a, 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 an average, you know, company that has, you know, their, uh, their ducks in a row and uh, their general ledgers are, you know, clean uh, and, and, you know, make, make, open to making themselves accessible. I'd say it would take, you know, between, between six weeks and two months to take their information and get it ready in a form and format that is ready for a sale. So that's, you know, about two months. Again, it could bleed, you know, later than two months, depending if the company, you know, really is, you know, slow in providing information. But on average, let's say two months. Then we begin the reach out and we, we've already sort of identified potential buyers. So we first on a no names basis, will reach out to the buyers. Hey, we have this company. This is what they do financially. This is what they do. You know, this is their story, the product, et cetera. <clears throat> Are you interested? And we'll go out wide, you know, to potentially between 10 and as many as, you know, 25 or 30 potential buyers. They'll come back and say, hey, this is really interesting to us, but this has been on a no names basis. We'll then negotiate non-disclosure agreements, which each of them, which, you know, it takes a couple of days because sometimes their attorneys have, you know, things that they specifically want, but, um, and we sign, you know, we both sign a non-disclosure. My, my uh, seller sells the, signs a non-disclosure, the potential buyer signs a non-disclosure, and then we provide them the confidential information memorandum and the information. And they have a couple of days to digest it, you know, get a sense of things. And then we reach out and set up either Zoom calls, especially given you know the COVID world that we we, we finished going through, um, either Zoom calls with management or actually in in force management. And thank goodness you know there have been more of those recently. 
and it's an opportunity to you know give potential buyers you know an hour and a half two hour window where they get to hear the the seller's story you know see them even on zoom or you know in person hear from them you know their their the 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 story from from the horse's mm-hmm. mouth and you know based on that they get to ask you know questions hear about things but you know ask any pertinent questions that came out of reviewing the confidential information memorandum you know it may be certain things that we didn't touch upon you know that are very important to them and then um when all of those calls are done the bar- the potential buyers are told that they have about 10 days to come back with a, a non-binding letter of intent uh, where they will lay out not just the financial uh, their financial interests, but they will talk about in the letter of intent sort of other plans that they have, plans for the employees, what they're going to do, plans for the business. It's, it's usually a vibrant letter, you know, three to five pages that lays out the financial terms of what they'd like to purchase the company for, but also their, their, their plans for the future for the company. We get the, the, those in. Um, you know, like I said, they have about you know ten days to do it, um, and then my team, together with the seller, we we review all of the letters of intent. We, my team, we lay out to the we lay out to the seller um, the pros and cons of of, of each of, in each of the LOIs, and they've also gotten a feel. So they might um, even have their own preference. They might have their own preference. It might. It's n- not always about just the higher highest right. dollars. I like that. I like I mentioned, it's about will 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 we'll take on the company, take care of their baby. Exactly. Who will be the right fit for their company? So uh, of course, you know, they might find someone who who is offering a little less that they feel is right by, and they'll send us back to them and say, "Hey, could you you know up your bid?" But um, and so that that part of the process, you know, can last, um, you know, a month or, you know, six weeks. Then once the seller decides, okay, we're going with ABC buyer, they sign a, a, they sign the letter of intent, give them exclusivity. And then it's about 60 to 90 days for them to do their due diligence, dig in more about the company and negotiate the purchase agreement. So that whole process, as we, we've sort of laid out, can take as be as quick as four months, or on the you know longer side could be you know six months. I can't promise you that some deals have gotten done in three months. Some deals have taken you know seven, eight, or nine months, but on average, four to six months is the right uh, the right time frame. And just also in a in a general way, what are some of the uh, upfront costs that a company should be thinking about that? You know, in order to proceed with an M and A, there are probably some upfront costs out there that they have to factor in. Yeah, so so obviously, you know, separately they have to hire an attorney, um, you know, to represent them. Um, our, our 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 efforts and work is not for free. So you know, we get paid mostly. Mostly, what we get paid is 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 on success. Um, and so the, the the an attorney, they'll probably want some accounting um, advice with regard to minimizing their capital gains taxes or any other taxes that they're paying around it. So um, it really the 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 the, um, the cost really depends on the size of the acquisition. I'll tell you, I had a, was selling a company here in the U.S. to a company from Taiwan, and literally the Taiwanese company probably spent over a million dollars on the acquisition. They flew in accountants. They flew in probably 20 people, their, their, their own people. They flew in lawyers. They also engaged local lawyers. So really, depending on the acquisition, it could be a you know, significant, significant amount of money. But we, we help our clients identify sort of you know, attorneys and, and, and accountants and, and keep people in line, sort of minimize those costs. What an amazing show. The time flies. We are nearly out of time, but before I let you go, how can people find out more about Rockshore? So we have our uh, website, rockshoreadvisors.com, where you can hear, see everything you, you want to know about the Rockshore and Sheldon Brickman. And as well, you can reach out to me directly, 917-743-4444, 917-743-4444. I'm not going to have my assistant answer. I will answer the phone directly and have a nice conversation with you. 
Amazing. What an incredible show all about mergers and acquisitions right here on Mind Your Business. Well, that wraps up a great edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR. Um, Tune in again next Sunday night for another great edition of Mind Your Business right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York. Have a successful week. Thank you for watching and make sure to subscribe to this channel and be notified every single time a new video goes live. Don't miss out on any of the weekly interviews that I have with top business leaders, sometimes Fortune 500 executives. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications.